months ago, I was reluctant to watch Astro Boy out of fear of it being a large amount of meaningless battles and outdated kids' humor. But instead, I discovered themes of war, racism, human rights, and more. Today's Beginner's Guide to Astro Boy covers the bulk of its franchise. I'm primarily focusing on its main entries and following up with a curated watch order to make it easily approachable for new viewers. Thankfully, each Astro Boy entry is a standalone series, though their introductions remain similar. Astro is an android built in the likeness of Dr. Tenma's deceased son, who's eventually disowned for not being human enough. Although subsequent events vary, he's canonically sold to the circus as a robot slave. Upon being freed by Dr. Elephant, the Minister of Science, Astro's pure-hearted nature and unparalleled strength compel him to protect the weak and, ultimately, the Earth. Although Astro Boy 1963 still has modern appeal in some episodes, the older generations will likely enjoy it the most, so if you're already accustomed to shows like the original Jetsons, you'll feel right at home. But for everyone else, the key to enjoying it most is to allow yourself to laugh at it for being corny. Everyone here has been crushed by falling debris, except me. Correction! Everyone here has been crushed, including me! While I wasn't happy to be limited to watching a 60s English dub, I think it's actually funnier in spite of it. A rabbit's head, a giraffe's neck, and a squirrel's tail. Yes, 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 yes! This one was obviously a mistake. I will never hurt it, but I will not make any more. In terms of its more intentional humor, we see things like Astro being injected with horsepower from a robotic horse and galloping around. Much of its humor stems from cuteness, like how Astro takes in fuel through his butthole. I guess they had a different standard of cuteness back then. How about these doggy-shaped police cars? Kinda reminds you of Dumb and Dumber, doesn't it? Then there's Astro's sister, Uron, the pint-sized wrecking ball effortlessly demolishing menacing war machines in the robot coliseum. She's strong and brave, but often finds herself in need of rescue from her older brother. I enjoyed Uron for her lack of predictability since Astro characteristically handles everything. One of my favorite pure comedy episodes was 50. Here, Astro takes time away from fighting powerful aliens to time travel back to the Wild West. As you can imagine, even the rootinous, tootinous, sharpshootinous bandits are no match for a 100,000 horsepower android. Considering they're out of their element, they unknowingly take this sack of freshly stolen gold from defeated bandits, becoming the town's prime suspects. I enjoyed watching Astro and his crew outsmart everyone with their superior knowledge while clueless about their environment. Maybe I'm partial to this one because it feels like one of the Western holodeck episodes from Star Trek. In short, its humor is hit or miss, but it doesn't appear to be the main point of the anime. Thankfully, its morals offer much more substance that can still be appreciated today. I was surprised to find several misunderstood antagonists who've only adapted their twisted ways to cope with tragedy. While most are combative, some are more mysterious. One example is episode 11, loosely based on the Russian folktale Ivan the Fool. The story follows Astro on a spaceship searching for a stowaway jewel thief avoiding arrest. The plot thickens as the ship is damaged, causing them to escape and crash land on an asteroid. Instead of a typical adversarial plot, Astro and the crew, including Louis the Thief, must work together to survive this harsh environment. I loved how it focused on themes of greed and how teamwork is superior to self-preservation in times of danger. Although Louis is initially characterized as a hardened criminal, he's much more empathetic and rational. On the other hand, He's contrasted against the misanthropic owner of a large insurance company, described as a legal thief and an even greater leech on society. Characters aside, it's one of my favorite episodes because it's so multifaceted. It blends mystery and adventure as the terrain alternates between inhospitable and accommodating. This implies a struggle to manage resources at night, but the freedom to explore during the day. The allure of the environment is heightened by the mystery of a derelict spaceship and a large robot. Sadly, 
Characters like Louie are rare in the 60s anime, but there's many similar to the insurance salesman willing to risk everyone's lives for diamonds. Thankfully, Tezuka makes use of these one-dimensional baddies by conveying morals. For example, episode 28 depicts the struggle between robot workers and their wealthy industrialist overlord as they plea for an annual day off. It's a pro-union theme displaying the rich in a position of unlimited power. They refuse to part with a modicum of profit, yet when workers get their way, they're willing to spend exorbitantly on vengeance. These themes are complemented in several episodes, one being 75, echoing the detrimental effect of unchecked capitalism. Here, a greedy real estate tycoon demolishes a marine ecosystem to build an underwater city, angering the dolphins. Thankfully, Astro Boy is here to save the day, because they sure don't want Cyborg 008 to do it. So it's up to Astro to become the arbiter of peace, reasoning with the humans to prevent a war. I love how Tezuka addressed these issues so long ago, but it's kind of depressing that they're still relevant today, like the episodes featuring corrupt government officials funding shoddy construction work or automotive executives lobbying against more efficient transportation, not to mention the Nazis. For all its valuable themes, there's several questionable episodes, notably 17 when Astro gains human emotions despite already conveying them many times. With these emotions, He's stricken by fear, incapable of stopping any threat. The episode ends after Astro Boy removes his heart, and Dr. Snaw states that you can't be a hero with human emotions. There's also episode 29, Memory Day. Here, families order robot replicas of their deceased loved ones. Due to high demand, Astro Boy fills in by dressing as a similar-looking boy and living with his family. It turns out their son only died a week ago, and they're already replacing him. In fact, they don't even know that he's dead. He just disappeared, and they gave up looking after a week. I'm not criticizing it for bizarre morals. In fact, that's one of the reasons I find vintage media enjoyable. It's both similar and different in ways you never expected. Out of everything in Astro Boy, its audio preservation quality aged the worst. I should warn you that a few episodes sound like this. I knew you'd slow down before something terrible happens. Focus it, sister. I'm only having a little fun. This is why the hopefully inevitable 1963 Blu-ray collection should favor subtitles over an English dub. With dubbing, you lose audio and video quality, as well as many episodes from now-famous directors. The localization cherry-picked 104 out of 194 episodes. Admittedly, it contains most Tezuka, Yamamoto, and Takahashi episodes, while omitting most Tomino and Dezaki-directed episodes. While they were clearly before their prime, some of their episodes could be enjoyable, along with other overlooked content, such as the famous World's Strongest Robot mini-arc. Unfortunately, future 1963 projects must choose between translating 200 episodes or keeping the English version with all of its preservation issues. The English audio cannot be used as a bonus audio track to the better-looking Japanese footage because the episodes were edited to remove Japanese text and violent imagery. Surprisingly, the edits weren't all bad, as I simultaneously watched both versions of several episodes. The localization noticeably improved the episode's flow by shortening lengthy, repeated animations, reducing runtime by a few minutes. Overall, I give the English localization of Astro Boy a 7 out of 10. I had a hard time getting into it, but I eventually resonated with its casual episodic experience, nonsensical antics, and moral and political undertones. It's like the original Star Trek's older cousin. If you're interested, I recommend following my curated watch order. While there's likely a few good episodes I missed, I believe these are enough to pique your interest and provide a genuine experience. I understand if 1963 is a bit dated for many to enjoy, so thankfully, the 1980 Astro Boy was a tremendous improvement. Tezuka saw the remake as another chance to get everything right. This time, it's directed by Noboru Ishiguro, eventual director of Legend of the Galactic Heroes. Surprisingly, I immediately knew I'd enjoy the remake. It's one of the most beautiful early 80s anime I've ever seen, and it's in crisp HD with all of the imperfections. 
This might sound weird, but the dust specks and paint errors make the anime even better. It's a constant reminder that you're watching hand-painted artwork that wasn't perfect and preserved exactly how it was. Astro's introduction covers three episodes instead of one. This new Astro Boy is much darker and more emotional, yet more balanced with its humor than its predecessor. Here we see more of Tobio and Tenma's relationship, the rise and fall of his second chance at fatherhood, and Astro's eventual experiences as a circus slave. Although I also enjoyed 1963's introduction, there was too much crammed within a single episode. Now, we actually see Astro forming meaningful connections with the other slaves, which have a lasting impact on his development. In addition to these enhancements to its opening act, it introduces Astro's rival, Atlas. I love their combative yet brotherly rivalry reminiscent of Professor X and Magneto. While they're both built from the same schematic, their experiences and programming shaped them to become polar opposites. Despite Astro's hardships, he still sees the positive in life because of the few who love him. On the other hand, Atlas had a much harsher upbringing filled with manipulation and tragedy, shaping him to see humanity as evil. I loved how the gradually escalating feud between Astro and Atlas occurred about every 10 episodes. This intermittent conflict was a welcome change because it always felt like an unexpected treat. While I thought the Atlas arc had a meaningful conclusion, my expectations were totally different, leading to some confusion regarding the anime's final act. So to avoid disappointment, I'll warn you that the arc ends on episode 43, followed by nine standalone episodes, likely symptomatic of being cancelled. Regarding its episodic content, the remake faithfully enhances nearly everything I enjoyed about its predecessor. Of course, the most welcome update was its comedy and action, which needed it the most. Comically speaking, I loved when Uran hijacked the anime, becoming its central character for several episodes. Watching her ransack a shopping mall to look for a cockroach, or fighting in the robot arena, or strangely looking for God was satisfying enough that I was ready for an Uran spinoff. She's got such an entertaining presence that I didn't mind her occasionally breaking out into song, plus her episodes even have their own unique Uran-themed endings. Her big bro Astro also contributes to the laughs with his trademark asymmetrical fights. You've seen him beat up bandits. Prepare yourself for Astro beating crocodiles against each other until they become handbags. If that's not enough, he occasionally seen beating enemies with entire factories. The anime is filled with running jokes like Astro flying through walls with disregard. However, my favorite things to look out for were anime references. There's a ton of Tezuka references and background characters, toys, guest appearances, and more, but there's even several Gundam references. Compared to 1963, the remake takes a less is more approach to combat, which I greatly appreciated. After all, Astro wasn't built for war, so fighting isn't his first response. Instead, he understands the complexity of conflict and tries to resolve things peacefully by understanding everyone involved. This allows the anime to prioritize characters and situations over action, which I actually prefer. Nonetheless, action is a part of Astro Boy, and it excels when focused on. A prime example is the famous World's Strongest Robot mini-arc, spanning episodes 24 and 25. The premise is that there's a million horsepower robot programmed to destroy Earth's seven strongest robots. What makes the arc special is Pluto's complex characterization I don't want to spoil. The arc includes many of the anime's greatest features and a single storyline, as it's filled with exciting battles but also is fairly dramatic. Unfortunately, I couldn't reliably compare the arc to its 1963 counterpart as it was never translated. However, there is an overlap between 1980 and some of its predecessors' localized content. Considering many of the original episodes were already good, I was surprised to prefer several from the remake. 
Generally, their presentation is superior, they're usually more emotional, and they convey the same idea and morals with a slightly different plot, prioritizing a darker and more emotional experience. One of my favorite episodes from 1963 was episode 3, following Astro's journey to Mars as captain of his own ship and the snazzy outfit to boot. It reminds me of the Next Generation episode, when Data is given command of a starship only to be undermined by his first officer. The same thing happens here because he doesn't trust the judgment of an android. Although it's still enjoyable for its mystery of the missing astronaut and the adventure elements, I thought 1980 was much better for characterizing and developing the insubordinate second officer. For all its improvements, the original episode was much funnier, like when Astro withstands such insane g-forces that his clothes rip off, or when his crew struggles with a zero-gravity environment. There's also episode 20 that parallels the 1963 English episode 5, featuring an incomplete robot child longing for his missing father. In both cases, his father turns out to be a criminal who manipulates his son to steal treasure. However, I prefer the 1980 version because it develops the young robot and his father much more, making his father a believable and dynamic character. The episode is further elevated by its boost in art and animation quality, mainly when the boy is completed and transforms into different animals. I'm also glad they revisited the idea of Astro being humbled after experiencing the human condition. In the aforementioned 1963 episode, human emotions were a hindrance. Thankfully, 1980 episode 47 strays from giving Astro emotions and illustrates the value of human frailty. Here, he struggles with not having aspirations because his potential is limitless. It shows that the difficulties we face are the spice that gives our dreams meaning, and that we can try repeatedly regardless of failure. Overall, I found Astro Boy 1980 to be the most approachable entry in the franchise. It's a faithful remake that improves upon nearly everything, and it's fully translated and remastered. Needless to say, it would be a mistake for anyone to dismiss it simply because it was cancelled. I give it an 8 out of 10. Although I'd love another 50 episodes of comparable quality, the remake gives me everything I need. I recommend it to all fans of Astro Boy and First Time Watchers. Astro Boy 2003 is closer to a reimagining than a faithful remake. It takes the same premise and characters, but alters the personality of some and introduces many more. This time, it favors a linear narrative slightly more by gradually advancing its plot during seemingly episodic events. It's also the most beautiful, considering it's a late-era cell animation that articulately details every aspect, from creative and vast futuristic cityscapes to the technology within, such as mechanical doors opened with a high five. It feels like their entire world was created by Leo Shishio from Gal Gygar in terms of its cute and eccentric gadgets. Character designs are more rounded and adorable than before, but that's no surprise as they always felt like the perfect match in every entry from their respective decades. The action was also overhauled, beautifully detailing acceleration with boosters blasting off like rockets, filling the screen with dust and debris. It's like they've turned physics on for the first time, and it's incredible. The same goes for its combat, where robots appear to have weight as Astro takes them down with a shockwave vibrating the camera. Action is back on the menu, but thankfully it doesn't overwhelm. I think 2003 had the most potential to attain mass appeal for finding the balancing point between humor, action, fantasy, and drama. Although 2003 offers the most linear plot with the most recurring characters, there's still lots of episodic gems, like when Astro loses his memory and lives with technology scavengers outside the city, or the traveling robot circus illegally fostering a human child, to name a few. While most of these standalone episodes are original to the franchise, there's a few heavy influences from the originals, such as the Pluto mini-arc. Once again, the world's strongest robot arc spans two episodes depicting the fearsome Pluto. While it's arguably the best-looking Pluto arc, I preferred everything else in 1980. It feels like there's more time for Pluto to develop, along with his meaningful interactions with characters who I won't spoil. 
In terms of other noteworthy characters, Astro Sister Uran returns and is just as cute and comical as before, but doesn't take center stage as often as in 1980. However, my favorite original character is the prideful Delta, leader of a robot anti-crime unit who's initially offended by Astro and almost jealous of his unparalleled strength. I'm being intentionally brief because I don't think it's fair for me to give 2003 a full review just yet. Despite its storytelling and visuals providing what's likely the greatest gateway into the Astro Boy franchise, its current state is likely unwatchable for many viewers. Unfortunately, it suffers from a botched western release containing shuffled episodes and a bad English dub. Although there are several standalone episodes, its introduction and conclusion are linked together by a chain of events and character interactions, so you must see the entire series. Unfortunately, the second half has no official English translation. The one we have comes from someone in China with a poor understanding of the language. While some may find the fan sub bearable, I thought it was the worst I've seen. I found myself constantly frustrated over changing names and frequent grammatical errors to the extent that I couldn't focus on the anime. If you're watching this video in the future, I'd recommend checking for a better translation. I felt like Astro Boy 2003 could be an 8.5 out of 10 and the optimal recommendation for newcomers. I say this because several familiar characters have different personalities, some of which are surrounded by mystery, so returning Astro Boy fans may not enjoy these elements as much. Unfortunately, 2003 marks the end of Astro Boy and the beginning of the franchise cash-in saga. First, 2017's Adam the Beginning attempts to flesh out Dr. Tenma and the professor's backstory by looking into their young adulthood, but it offers no substantial value. While it's occasionally funny and interesting for being the only anime I've seen with a robotics team, its quality would be the same without its weak ties to Astro Boy. I give it a 5.5 out of 10. There's also the American Hong Kong joint effort CG movie from 2009. It's cute and probably fun for young children as it occasionally has sentimental character interactions and extravagant action scenes. However, anyone familiar with the franchise will likely see it as a vapid imitation. Robot Adam is an 80-minute long miniseries aimed at preschoolers. I don't know what young kids want, but it's probably not this. I found its voice acting and plot abysmal and devoid of any meaning. Hey, boy in the red boots, get your dirty hands off of me. I'm gonna be in that race too. The one episode I watched was about a race to win snacks. Why any machine would need a snack enough to compete for it is beyond me. However, if you're looking to share Astro Boy with young children, I'd recommend Go Astro Go. I've only watched two episodes, and it's nothing like its source material, but at least it feels educational. For example, episode 2 teaches the harms of pesticides and the value of natural pest deterrents, like using ladybugs to prevent aphids. It even recommends a few types of flowers to attract ladybugs. It's also dubbed, and I think it sounds much better. Aphids! Question is, why are there so many aphids in this garden? But ladybugs need more food variety. They love the nectar and pollen in certain flowers. Moving on to the manga, I'm covering them last because that's the order I experience them. It's not like Cyborg 009 or Gegege no Kitaro, where their respective 60s anime offered no introduction. The black and white Astro Boy anime gave me everything I needed, so I mainly use the manga for reference, since the episodes and chapters have roughly the same names. The only available is the Dark Horse Omnibus Collection, which appears to be a recompilation similar to Gekage no Kitaro. They seem to be in print and well received on Amazon, though some note that it's a little too small to read comfortably. However, what I enjoyed most were the writer's notes, the first two pages of many chapters including Tezuka illustrating himself discussing his mindset at the time, or various issues relating to the anime, and he's pretty candid about it. Lastly, a manga I can fully recommend is Naoki Urasawa's Pluto, and it was a mind-blowing experience easily one of the best manga I've read in years. It takes the framework of the world's strongest robot mini-arc and embellishes it with the same degree of suspense you'd get from Monster. 
It's set in an alternate sci-fi Earth following a Europol agent tracking down clues behind a series of murders where someone shoves steel rods through victims' skulls resembling horns. There's also a parallel story following several of the strongest robots. Everyone seems to have a dark past tying back to the war and struggling to live with their memories. There's a lot of corruption and suspenseful reveals. Plus, what I love most was the looming sense of danger. All I can say are that these robots are like gods among men, and Pluto is a step beyond. Everyone you'll expect to find is here, and their priorities are totally different than you're expecting. In fact, Astro Boy isn't even a central character for much of the story. The art is just as dark and ominous as you'd expect for Urasawa, perfectly setting the tone. I was surprised by how well he can illustrate a sci-fi environment. As far as I'm concerned, Pluto is the king of gritty reboots. There's nothing like it. I give it a 9.5 out of 10. Although it seems viewers enjoyed Pluto without prior Astro Boy knowledge, I'd recommend waiting until you watch one of the anime. You know how I am about spoilers, and the stories felt so different that I felt like nothing was spoiled. Now on to the part you're all waiting for, my recommended watch order. You really only need one of the major Astro Boy anime, but because I enjoyed 1980 the most, I recommend everyone start there. It's the most approachable entry, plus it's the only one here with a Blu-ray release. It's got a fantastic HD remaster, it's complete and the most legibly translated. Plus, I, I just enjoyed its story the most. 2003 would be another valid starting point if not for the poor translation of its final 25 episodes. However, if you're okay with that, then it's still a good place to start. Just avoid the English dub at all costs because it's a re-edit. Also, just a reminder that if you're in the future, check for a recent subtitle translation as the problem could be resolved in coming years. I know 60s anime isn't for everyone, but I still recommend trying the original Astro Boy anime. For your convenience, I've compiled a list of the most noteworthy episodes so you can easily have what I consider the best black and white Astro Boy experience. After finishing one of these anime, I recommend everyone read Pluto, regardless of your interest in manga. It's totally worth your time, however, 1963 viewers will need to watch 1980 episodes 24 and 25 since the Pluto arc isn't in the black and white English version. Thank you all for watching, let me know if you enjoyed Astro Boy, if you watched anything from this video because of the video, let me know about that as well, especially if you checked out any 1963 episodes. Um, Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you soon with another video.